blah, blah. Okay, so just a reminder, this is lesson four um, on natural language programming. And like the rest of the book so far, or the, I should say the, uh, the, the lessons so far, um, these, it's a very high level approach, right? We're just going to, he's going to use these huggy face models in the, in the case of the video. And in the case of the book, he uses the fast AI uh, language models. And the fact that one of them is an RNN and the other one's a transformer <laughs> isn't really important at this level. It's kind of cool. At first, I'm like, well, I want to know how these things work. I think every one of us probably has the same feeling. I'm like, no, no, I want to know how these things work. But when you think about it a little bit, it almost doesn't matter, right? The details of the model don't matter. All you need to know is, hey, here's the model, here's how it works, here's how you feed the data, and here's how you evaluate it, right? How it works, it, knowing how it works doesn't actually help you very mm -hmm. much. It maybe help you a little bit to know that you're dealing with a transformer that has like a finite um, size context window or whatever, and might affect your data, whereas an RNN can work with longer context windows. But on the other hand, the RNN will forget long things anyway, so maybe it doesn't actually... Yeah, that's a bad division, but you know what I'm saying? There might some kind of technicalities like that might matter, but in the end, it all has to wash out uh, in the uh, mix, as it were. And then when you do the evaluation on a sample, right, you'll find out which one is uh, a better model for whatever your data, whatever your data is um, at the time. So, again, yeah, so it's, I just uh, to... in keeping with that, with the what making learning whole or whatever that Jeremy's Jeremy Howard's all about, right? Just, yeah. just learning how to play the ball game. We're I think the first series, right, part one is really about that, learning how to play ball. Right. Not really getting buried in the details. And he makes the point that, um, well, by the way, this is pre just to prelude this whole thing. So my approach to this is since we already have a video, we already have a book, my approach, I'm just going to hit some highlights of things that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, and then you guys, of course, jump in like you have and just say, hey, here's something else I thought was important or interesting. Uh, when he's going through the work. Oh, I should share my screen. I have some notes I can at least share here. If I can remember how to do that. I'm using, I've been using Teams so much, I've kind of, kind of forgot how to work this program. Here it is. Um, this, I guess, is it, yeah. Okay, so you should see my notebook here. Uh, go away with this thing. There we go. Can you see my notebook? Lesson four. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yes. So this is basically what I was just saying. It's like, you know, all the details of these models, we will come back to them. Uh, chapter 12 goes into more details on how RNNs work. Uh, and in part two, I think toward the end, he'll actually talk about how this transformer architecture works and the famous attention is all you need paper and all that. I think it's a big revolution in, in natural language programming. Um, but but to follow on what you were saying, one of the key things, just knowing what we know now from this chapter or this lesson, we have a lot of power and he says like a lot of things can be uh, put into this category of uh, natural language classification, right? There's one particular tool, natural language classification has a huge uh, application probably uh, for a lot of people like business models. He was saying things like, oh, you can do like sentiment analysis on reviews of your products. You can do um, author identification. You can do triaging of incoming emails. These are all things he said in the video, but it's extremely powerful. Uh, this one technique without knowing how it works, but we know how to do we know how to do it, uh, the data science properly, right? We know how to do the train valve split. We know how to evaluate our models. We know how to process the data and we know how to avoid, or we, we hope we can learn how to avoid mistakes and how we do those things, right? So those are kind of more important actually than knowing how an RNN works. But it's more important to know that, hey, that's the wrong kind of validation split you're doing there, right? That's the big error. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. not as much fun, I guess, but those are the things that are, are really important. So that's kind of the main takeaway I have of this whole thing, by the way, but, uh, but going back in the details, so in the video lecture, he just goes over the Kaggle notebook, which as you remember from last time at the end, he said, hey, go off and do this Kaggle notebook. So probably you've already done the Kaggle notebook. You've watched him do the Kaggle notebook. So we've got to hit that pretty hard, I think. Um, but it's just an example of doing natural language program using Hugging Face uh, library. And just a reminder, he does this patent uh, phrase to phrase matching thing. It's a competition on Kaggle, but the, uh, the idea was that there's these anchors and there's targets, and then there's uh, context that you're supposed to evaluate those, in, and then there's a score from zero to one, being how much they uh, agree with each other, how similar the, uh, the the anchor and the target are, right? In the in, within the context, that sounds like a hard problem. Like, how am I going to solve that? But it turns out it, it was kind of cool. The trick is you just turns into a classification problem by just shoving all those things together into a string, 
right? Here's the text, here's the anchor, here's the, you know, uh, the other text. And then it doesn't even matter what, what you know, I, this text one text you and ink one, whatever that you, those could be other things too. It doesn't matter what they are. It seems like he said, he did like, you know, ablation study to see what does that really matter. No, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Right. So the first seems like, wow, that's gonna be really hard. I gotta like make some complicated model that takes in like different pieces of text and somehow combines them together, but no, you just shove them together. <laughs> Pretty cool. I um, so that's the, basically the, um, the, uh, the problem, right. That's being solved in the, in that notebook um let's see in both the video and the notebook he does this like a side that takes a large part of the video on the train valve mm -hmm. test split which i actually kind of just skimmed to through because i hammered down that road a long time as probably you have as well um but what i did find interesting was this he presented this link to this other uh website what was it actually it was um on a, it's a blog post from him, right? The links here, I, these, my notes are posted on the, uh, on my GitHub if you want to, but this link is in the, uh, in the notes for the course as well, right? How and why to create a good validation set. That I thought was pretty valuable. And I did learn a few things about that, right? Like just how, how easy it is to make a mistake in your validation set choice, right? Um, I mean, some things we all know, well, if you're doing prediction, obviously forecasting, you don't do, uh, you know, one out of 10, you know, validation you have to validate on future predictions that makes sense there's some other like trickier things in there uh where like about the um there's something about the distracted driver thing right where it's important that you you left out so people that were never used di different different characters yeah. right yeah, yeah. And yeah different people in your validation set yeah. right i thought that was neat too and, and not necessarily obvious no if you're kind of working quick, quickly through a problem yeah, so that was cool. Um, he talks about the the Pearson correlation coefficient. Okay, I, you know what that is. Um, I do think his presentation could have been. I just made a note here. I think it could have been clear if you would have standardized his variables because he's talking about slope, but really it's the slope um, in a standardized space where it more corresponds to the correlation coefficient. But whatever. Yeah. Um, then he talks about metrics and there's something that's interesting too. But I think we're all aware of this issue with metrics where. You have to be careful where you know the you know Goodhart's law measure becomes a target. It seems to be a good measure, and I've personally experienced this in uh, you know, in life as a when I was working in retail. They always had these different incentive programs. And they always had these unintended consequences. I remember um, a long time ago, I used to work at the Radio Shack store, and one of the metrics they used was your um, ticket average, like how much money was on every ticket, right? This had the unintended consequence, though, that sometimes if somebody comes walking in and you and they go right for the battery section, like all the salespeople like just disappear. <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with it. He's going to buy a battery. Yeah. It's going to kill their ticket average, right? <laughs> so the idea was to try to make you upsell people, but the unintended consequence of people would avoid low selling. Low, you know, up. somehow they try to evaluate a customer. Is this guy going to be a good customer or not? So unintended consequences of these uh, metrics. And, I, and what they made the point is in the video is that AI makes this much worse because since if you train an AI, it'll go after this metric with a vengeance. <laughs> we we'll even know, run away. We we'll even know what it was doing. So. Have you uh, done any work in the Bomberland uh, environment for the AIs? Are you familiar with that? How they train the different AIs, agents, in environment? Oh, Bomberland? Bomberland. No, never mind that. It's based like based off of Bob Moran. Mm -hmm. Basically, the uh, goal is to survive or not be killed. Actually, sorry, the goal was to not kill, be killed by other people, and so it fixed it by killing itself because you can't have another person <laughs> kill you. Uh, but that, that, that's that's the point. That's of a good example sure too, that, yeah. like <laughs> you, you, that that difference between the intention and yeah, uh, it was. Uh, I mean, take a. Oh, you muted yourself, John, or did you? Oh, uh, I was, I was done. Oh, Sorry, okay. I kind of, <laughs> so I kind of faded off. Okay, good deal. No, that's true. So, that, that... And, yeah, and, and, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish, finish your thought, Ron. I was just going to say before you move move to the next next section, just just um, uh, a point uh, was brought up in the video that I thought was was good. It's like, well, you've trained your model; it looks good on the validation set. Um, there are still going to be times where it does not look good on the test set. And I think the point there was like, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> you kind of have to start over from scratch. Hopefully I'm getting that right. I thought that was basically one of the main themes he had. That was, you're right. I forgot about, I forgot about that. Um, in that, yeah, 
the point is you're supposed to hold your test side up to the very end. And then there's always a danger of overfitting on your validation data, right? Why you're like, oh, we're going to try this model, right. try that exactly. model, try this model, to tune this type of parameter. And then, you know, a few months of that, you come back, well, time to test and run on the test data. And it performs horribly. You go, oh, I've overfit on my validation data. And he said, well, I guess at that point, you really are stuck. You got to throw it all out and start over again. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I don't know how you avoid that other than just don't be too aggressive with your hyper hyper fading, I guess you might call it. I don't know if that's the right word, but <laughs> well, right. I mean that the more often you're you're checking against the validation set, the more likely you are to overfit, right? Yeah. Gotta... Yeah. It yes, right. Yeah. The, Using up your the, data, as they say. In the notebook itself. I'm not sure if this is the right place to bring that up or if maybe course, further down yeah. in your notebook. It was basically, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll copy it in here. It's from two years ago, so it might be out, outdated, but it sounds like there's a, a technique of kind of freezing the model and then train for one epoch and then unfreeze it and then train again. Uh, and the author said there was no reason he didn't include it, um, but it sounded like there's been some benefits of using it. I wasn't sure if you're familiar with this yeah, technique so or if is, that's applicable here. It is. So in the chapter, um, what does it say? Uh, right. So in the chapter, in the book chapter, when he's using the fast AI library, he does do that. He, okay. he does do that where he first unfreezes only the end final layer. Everything else frozen. He trains it. Then he unfreezes everything and then trains it again. Then, and in fact, when he does the classification project, uh, the, the final training, that's step three. We haven't got to that, what that is yet, but you, you remember there's the three steps. This ULM fit thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third step, training on the actual class on the label data on the classification problem. He does this even more fine tuned. He like un, you know just slowly unfreezes it and trains it and trains it and trains it. So uh, it's kind of slices it up pretty finely in that uh, in that one. So it now uh, is that. Is that the purpose for that, the concern with the overfitting, underfitting, or is this accomplishing a different goal here by doing that? For, I'm just not familiar with that. No, I think the, the reason for doing that is hopefully you can put, walk yourself into the in, into the right part of the solution space without wandering off too far, right? You don't want the thing to forget all the things it learned from the fine tuning. So you want to keep those frozen, but eventually you want to let those adjust a little bit. Okay. For, to optimize for your particular problem or try to, I mean, just always go back, right? In fact, I mean, that brings us to the next, so the next section of the video, he talks about, uh, actually, I'm not sure I have this in the right order, but the next section in my notes was about this whole idea of pre-training, right? So he mentioned this before in previous lectures, but in this one, um, he makes the point again about this, the value of this pre-training. One of them is a self-supervised learning, right? You're actually able to train on a large amount of data that you have no labels for. The labels are in the data. And in this case, it's the next word uh, prediction or actually for the transformers, that he was using um, the BERT type models, it's a uh, masked word, right? So they mask out certain words and it tries to predict what the missing word is. And it's all uh, the actual correct word is in the data. So it's all there. You don't have to worry about labeling any data. And so um, the, and, and the other point he makes that is it uh, kind of unrelated, but what I just want to, since I have it here at a bullet point, I want to mention it is that this next word prediction or the mask word prediction. It seems to be, well, we all know this now, right? It's, it's extremely powerful, right? <laughs> Somehow these models develop a strong understanding, not just of, well, basically of language, but maybe also of logic and other things in order to make that prediction of the next word. Um, and we now know this because of the success of things like ChatGPT and Gemini and all the rest, but <laughs> it's extremely powerful. But in general, pre-training any model on in this way is very useful. Like another example is from graph uh, uh, graph machine learning. On graph machine learning, you may want to be doing like no prediction in particular. Like let's say you have a graph of like firms and you think some firms are are crooked <laughs> in some way and maybe their neighbors will tell you something about which firms are, are crooked or dishonest. Um, you don't have that many labeled nodes on which firms are good and which firms are not, right? So, but you can do a pre-training of your graph on like link prediction. I'll, instead of doing that, I'll do a link prediction, try to predict where the links are in the network. Right? So I'll leave a link out and say, hey, should there have been a link here or not? And that pre-training is on unlabeled self-pre-training, as it were, uh, can be very successful to get to warm the network up, as it were, then train on the what limited data you have on uh, labeled data. So that's the main approach of this pre-training thing. 
Uh, for Jeremy's UL, ULM, I think it's not UML, <laughs> but <laughs> ULM bit, uh, that's the approach he uses. And it's a three-step approach that step one, train language model on next square prediction or on uh, mass square prediction on some large corpus like Wikipedia, for example. And then do it again, but this time on your particular data set you care about. In this case, um, it would be, well, in that book case, it'd be IMD movie you use. In this case, it's your um, it's the data for the um, the patent data, right? But we're not doing it, we're not training it on classification. We're just letting it learn the structure of this new data, right? And then finally, step three, fine tune it on the on the labeled data. What labeled data you have by adding a class, taking off that the the final prediction next word prediction head and sticking on a classification head instead, right? Or mass word prediction head, whatever you're using. Um, and to, to back to your question, John, too, he does, in the video, I just want to point out, they did uh, talk about the, use the CNN as an example, right? So the earlier layers of the CNN had more, uh, were more about details and the later la layers of the CNN were had more bigger structure, like, you know, eyes and whiskers or whatever for cats. Um, and, and that's kind of the same kind of thing. So the last layer was classification of what kind of animal it was. That's the one you want to retrain on, um, because they're going to be all initialized to random value, re retrain on whatever it is your problem is. And the earlier layers, you really don't want to mess with them much. But after you've done that, you could go back and do another uh, fine tuning, letting those those earlier layers um, change. And it seems like you'd want to walk, if you're going to do it gradually, you probably want to start out at the end and work your way in, right? Because probably the very beginning layers are pretty universal, like, you know, a line or a dot or whatever. I think the same thing might be true mm -hmm. for these uh, language models as well, right? The earlier layers, the language oh, model have more general concepts and later layers are more task specific, right? So That's I don't think that helps you. at all, but. Yeah, I, I preface it, probably obviously I didn't get a chance to watch the video this week. So thank you for letting me know that's in there. So I'll look yeah, forward. It's, yeah, it's in there. Um, so when you do this fit, you're in a real project, um, you're gonna do it just like you did here. Right? This actually really is a real project, right? This is kind of cool, right? This is a, this is a competition, but it's very close to something you might wanna do. Um, and so you, the first step is already done for you. You look for pre-trained models that are already done. Now, the Huggy Face Model Library has a ton of these uh, pre-trained models. That are, some of them might be more specific, to, as he says in the video, to what you're trying to do. So you want to use those. But here he used a very general, the Stilbert V3 or whatever it was, uh, model uh, that's been trained on a large corpus and just on masked word prediction. Yeah, and I know, I know the uh, video is a couple of years old now. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeremy was talking about trying to incorporate Hugging Face into the Fast AI library. I didn't go through the extra step to see if it actually is already there or not. I did. Um, I, I don't and, see and, it. I, as far as I can tell, what all the Fast AI stuff still does is the RNN uh, model. It looks okay. like they, there's a chapter in the Fast AI library about using Hugging Face, but it's not like they incorporated it in a, in a, with a nice little layer. So you're still using Hugging Face and then in like transforming back and forth between their two representations, as far as I could tell. Okay. I didn't go into it too deeply, though. I may be wrong yeah. about that, but. was Is there like a general guideline or is it kind of similar with overall uh, model um, outputs of how much, uh, sorry, how much uh, using a transformer, how much uh, loss in accuracy is okay? Like, or is that a separate conversation on that? like? To know if like you can use the, the transformer versus an, an alternative one. Well, I mean, my approach would be to use like a tra small model transformer, and then uh, you know, see what my met. You know, you're going to use your metric right at the end to see whatever your metric is to see how. And again, this comes down to metric design. But just assuming you've got a metric that fits whatever problem you're trying to do, accuracy of the sentiment analysis, for example, you use the you know, say, hey, is that accurate enough for what I need? If it's not, do I use a bigger model of this type? Do I switch to a different model? You have to try. It's like any of these things. You have to try. You have to try several different models. But I, nevertheless, I guess. You, there's a. There, if you go to the library, you'll see like some models are extremely popular. I'd probably start with those. <laughs> yeah, than... that makes sense. I, sorry, I guess my, I didn't word that correctly. Uh, how much um, accuracy loss between a, a transformer versus if you do have the capability of working with. Uh, 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 a, not like training your own model, I should say. Like, is there an ex like, is there an 
like usually it's like 95 percent like bird versus distilbert like had like 95 percent accuracy um on some you know, yeah on, on some of it but like is like to understand if that is good enough or is it applicable to use a transformer i know like depends on situations but like is there any kind of like discussion in, in this about knowing if that transformer is good enough i guess um like for purposes or is it potentially um you know, taking away too much from the accuracy without having to fully train your own model in the first place, I guess, is, is this basically, as you said, just compare it to what you, your, our metrics are and whether or not we're approved with that, or um, is there any way to kind of make sure that we're not like thinking, oh, okay, we got 94%. That sounds great. But well, okay. So on... maybe I misunderstand your question, but just keep in mind, you are fully training your own model in the end, right? You're starting with pre-trained model. The weights are kind of set in a good spot. Uh, he uses yes. another another thing he does in the video. He, I think he does this in the video. Correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron. Maybe I'm maybe it was in the book, but he uses this analogy. No, it was in the video, and he uh, goes back to kind of the simple curve fitting thing, um, mm -hmm. where you have like three knobs, right? That you know change the coefficients. You have the three knobs. You move the you move the curve around trying to get it to fit mm -hmm. the points, right? And he says pre train is kind of like the knobs are almost close to where they need to be. Right. <laughs> But you still got to change the knobs. You might change this one knob first because the other knobs yeah. are better, but or something. But that th the point is that you're going to eventually change all the knobs. Um, so you're training your own model in the end. You're just starting off to hopefully at a better yeah. spot. Um, okay. And, and again, the only thing in the end, your validation is going to tell you whether or not this is a good way to go. I would also say that if you did try to train your own model of the size, even of of uh, diverted V3 small. On your only on your data, you probably find terrible performance because it's just not going to have enough labeled data to do anything. Right? Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I guess the use case that is most applicable for what was driving that question was, um, you know, looking at um, ocean or any kind of manifest data. They have like a free form of like I, of what's on there, and it doesn't always necessarily say like. You know, it might say tomatoes, but it's not going to say what the harmonized code is or, or, or sorry, the tariff code or Nick's code or any of those are. So building off of kind of like that, all those different Nick's codes and like, you know, there's a Nick's code for like tomatoes or you know, whatever, like being able to extract those out of it, just trying to understand if that, if these transformers, like, are, is, are, they, are they enough to like, there's no sentiment in it, I would say. It's more of kind of, there's a lot of other uses. I guess my question is, is like, in that case, it's not necessarily that I'm like, need to tra uh, train it on like, you know, everything I really just need to train it on um, the, you know, certain keywords and, and matches and stuff. So I was just curious if like, if, if when I set that up and go, go that route, is there a way for me to, without spending too much time one way or the other, kind of determine whether or not a transformer is the right for that problem set, I guess is, like, is it better, as you said, just yeah. to always try to start with a kind of some of those knobs turn it, even if it's not a specific one-to-one -one, and then just kind of with the data, we'll go throughout it. Or is, is there like a, again, it was just a, a general question if there was anything in there about like determining is it best practice to start this way or is it more of a still a, a this depends on your situation and feel free to tell me that's completely off topic from this but um we we're talking about overfitting and under, um everything yeah. one thing that was uh interesting in the video is there was a distinction between like the architectures used for these models and then kind of what the the, the architecture is being used uh, and trained on, right? And so what you're talking about is like a highly domain-specific situation. Right. And, you know, there may not be an open source model like available off the shelf, but it seems like there is a need for that for a lot of folks, right? Where, you know, you have special codes, right? Uh, that may not be easy to train on just using up like Wikipedia or something like that. Um, so, so that's where, you, you know, you're profession you know whatever you specialize in it might be behoove uh folks to to actually have this kind of, uh you know models trained on that kind of data so it's it's a good question like would would the 
something trained on Wikipedia work for your use case? You know, I, I don't know, but it sounds like it doesn't always universally work. And so that's why yeah, some of those hugging face models are trained on specific corpuses that are yeah. very domain specific. Okay. I mean, gotcha. is your thing, is it a natural language problem even though it's just, it's just single words? Maybe it's not even an NLP problem. Oh, it's, it's a natural language uh, okay. problem because it's not only identical, like it's, not matching word for word it's trying to figure out if that matches okay. the industry so it's somebody basically exactly. saying on this manifest there includes this many things this includes this you know there's might be vin numbers all over the place and it currently is extracted out um by u.s customs and border patrol for the specific one but it's only if it's explicitly says in there h like code it equals oh, okay. this so trying to take it more from just a matching a string to actually being able to determine based on the context and everything so i believe it it would fit here i just wasn't yeah, sure like if sense. that the basis of a transformer more for the synth analysis on things outside of it would be a, a good starting point because I, lo I love the idea of the transformers um and, I mean, I would know, just try some time and everything. Experiment. Yeah. Experiment with it. See what you can find out. Yeah, I, I guess the, that boils down to the question is at what <laughs> at what point, like, is it still back to the, see what it gets out of the initial yeah. metrics and then stop when I see one is better than significantly different? Or is there like any, again, it's, it's just more of a yeah. theoretical question on how much time do I spend with a transformer where say, hey, this isn't working versus the other way spending um building my own from scratch and saying okay this isn't working is it yeah what do you mean by what are you going to build on your own from scratch though so i guess basically training the uh recognition off of have years of records from different companies countries and so on um so it's it's domain specific and it has its own language. There's the acronyms that are specific in yeah. there and so on. So, I mean, I keep mean, in mind that this problem is the kind of weird, right? I mean, like the originally he was training it on um, Wikipedia, right? Then he trained it on mm -hmm. next word or next word prediction, or I should say mask word prediction on this stuff. Well, this doesn't mm -hmm. look like anything like a Wikipedia, right? And that's why he did that. That second training was to, so it could under, learn this kind of structure. Um, there's codes, right? So it's not too terribly different than what you're talking that's true. about. That's true. So, so if like tomatoes for, uh, yeah. let's do a car tomatoes, parts for example. Yeah, exactly. If I if I say like Heart car, yeah. and then car parts, I would know that that's you know yeah. car part manufacturing. But if it says like a uh, uh, car and then says like bin or number or something, that would be okay. So th th this still Oops, could be there. okay. So that's actually a perfect use case for this then because yeah. I can pretty much tell it, hey, you've, you learn what this stuff mostly is, but here's domain specific. Yeah. So it learns okay. from Wikipedia or whatever, from the, the whatever they're pre-training these things on now. It learns language structure. You say it's a natural language problem, so it learns the language structure from that. But then it learns your specific domain during the, the, the next phase, step two of the ULM fit, right? And then finally, the step three is when you actually do your problem you're trying to actually do, right? So, so it's a three-step okay. process. Thanks. Yeah, I, it's been a while since I've been in NLP, and I've kind of stayed away from the Gen AI information and everything. So... Uh, just kind of, you know, yeah. it was came down and I was like, I want to make sure this isn't a buzzword uh, request from a stakeholder, more of actual, you know, possibility to do something like this. And this yeah. seemed very relevant to I think so. Okay, so back to the, the video, he, um, at the next part, he talks about this, these steps you have to take to make a language model work. Um, and uh, First, I'll just preface it by saying all these things are done automatically by the libraries, which is kind of nice, but it's probably useful to understand what's happening uh, in the library. So the first thing, and because, and it be also because there's choices to make here, right? Um, although maybe there isn't choices because I was just thinking the hugging face, whatever model you're using, you have to use their tokenizer and numericalizer and everything else. So you can't make any choices, but I guess it's useful to know there are different kinds, right? So there's, first thing you have to do is take your text and break it up into tokens. And tokens are just representations of uh, in a finite vocabulary, right? Of each piece of the text, right? So, and that can be done by words based on spaces, which is actually pretty un seems obvious, but pretty uncommon actually because it's not as uh, uh, powerful, especially when you have other languages or or, or like you said, uh, uh, non-language sequences like music or even code numbers and things like this. Maybe spaces aren't that uh, great. So instead, uh, they use subword tokens is the most common way to break these things up. And there's various subword tokenizers out there. And he discusses them in the video, and I, I don't think it's worth 
I'm going into too much detail because it's an evolving field of exactly what's what's the best sub subword tokenizer for a given um, problem, right? And finally, there's character base, which is um, fun too, and that's where you break up by character. Those are every character is a token, so you've got you know how many tokens you would have. I don't know what the hundred depending on what language you're using, right? Could be whether you use uppercase, lowercase, we as small as twenty seven tokens is right, including spaces, or it could be, you know, if you have special symbols, it could be many tokens, but still be a lot less tokens than you would for the subword or word-based token. So it's kind of fun um, model to play with. In fact, this, uh, if you're interested in that, there's Andrew, Andre Kaparthi, one of the open AI guys, or used to be, I'll put it in here, but in the chat has this great uh, little notebook he did called Unreasonable Effectiveness of RNAs Before Transformers were popular where he trains a uh, current neural network on next letter <laughs> prediction, not next word prediction, next letter prediction, uh, on Shakespeare, just to see what would happen. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Uh, it does produce some things that kind of look like Shakespeare, but yeah, it's not that great, but it's still surprising. It makes, it's surprising that it actually makes words and sentences, and they sort of almost make sense, but uh, it's a fun, fun little project. Any event, um, after you've tokenized it, now you have uh, a finite set of, of finite vocabulary, right? So whatever whatever the, the unique set of tokens are from your tokenization, that's your vocabulary. And you assign each one of them a number because in the end, the network needs numbers. It doesn't work on letters, so it needs numbers. So now your whatever your input text was has now become a list of numbers or a vector, right? A tensor of numbers because um, it's been numer numericalized. Uh, and then the next step is you need some kind of loader. Uh, and this, this is all done at a high level in the video. But in the end, what that will do, the, the, the language model loader will load your data. It will actually do the tokenization, numericalization, shuffle it, uh, generate the targets, the next token or the mass tokens, um, and, and all the rest of that, including the train test split, perhaps, right? Depending on which model you're, which uh, library you're using. And then you got to choose your model. Um, uh, again, this could be a transfer, it could be an R and N, but you know, for now, it's just some some differentiable, <laughs> right? In the end, it's just some differentiable model that you can compute a loss for and do gradient descent on. That's what it is, right? Uh, and in this case, it has to be able to handle arbitrary arbitrary lists of numbers, but that's, you know, there's a lot of models that can do that, and um, and that's basically the steps, right? That you have to take, and that's the steps he goes through in the notebook, and uh, that, that's what I got out of that. And what the actual calls are and what code you use depends. Uh, whether you're using the fast AI library, you're doing something with some other library from PyTorch directly, you're doing uh, you're doing with Hugging Face, whatever it is, how you actually do this is going to depend on that. Let's see. Uh, oh, one other note I just wanted to make is for this particular problem. Um, he calls it a classification problem, but it's really a regression problem because he's actually predicting this zero to one label. And it's kind of funny how he does it too, because he just does the linear regression, right? So he ends up with things bigger than one and smaller than zero. He, he mentioned at the end that at some point, well, he was going to teach us about the same boy function to solve it wrong. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, that's that. not the way I would have gone about it. <laughs> but that was kind of funny. But actually, it was a question at the end where somebody asked like, uh, about this. Like, hey, wait a minute. You do it, why, is that a, why is it giving you all these real numbers instead of classifications? You know, zero. In fact, it's four different labels, right? But he put number labels equal to one. Which it turns out you have to dig into the code to find this out. But with the Huggy Face library for these auto model for sequence classification, if you use number labels equal to one, you get regression using mean squared error loss, not classification using cross entropy. Um, so it's just like one of those many things in these libraries. Like you just have to like sometimes dig into the code to figure out what's going on, or even do we wouldn't even know that was an option, right? Like if that was even a possibility you could do. But number labels equal one really means regression, which almost means number labels equals infinity but <laughs> in some sense. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's odd odd naming convention there. Yeah, but people were, but uh, actually I think I also saw on, on the uh, on the forums too because people were like, hey, I thought I only had one label because it's a uh, you know. I'm, I'm just labeling it true or false or something like that. You think that's a one label. It's either there or it's not, but that's actually a two label problem. You put one label, you get weird results from doing that. So I, I guess the key takeaway from all that is that you, and he does get, you get really, you can get really good results using these pre-trained models. I mean, he's, you're able to go through that notebook pretty quickly and get state of the art at that time results on this patent matching problem, right? Um, contest winning results. If you did it at that time, if you somehow knew to do that. Um, 
Let's see. I just had a few other, that's the main part of the video. I don't know if anyone else wanted to highlight anything else, but I did have a few other notes from the video I just wanted to mention I thought were interesting. Um, one of them was that these, he when he wrote the UL fit, transforms were just coming around at that point. Um, and so he was using RNNs, but as he did in the video, he uses the transformers now. Again, it makes no difference. You can't actually tell. It's nothing, just other than the fact that's the model you're pulling off hugging space. Um, and, or hugging face, sorry. And, um, but I, he, he does point on the video, these advantages of the transformers and the fact that the reason why they are so successful is it doesn't suffer from this vanishing gradient problem because you're not working your way back and not having to uh, back propagate through time as they call it. And the other one is this, you can, you can do parallel training on these things on GPUs. And that was the way this big breakthrough with transformers happened. Although I guess that doesn't make a lot of sense. You don't know much about those architectures, which you don't yet, but. I did want to call it, he does say something weird. He says, transformers are not well suited to the next word prediction. I'm like, what? <laughs> Even in 2018, this is well known. So I don't, I'm confused by that, why he said that. Um, but I think he meant was for the classification transformers, which use a different, which use the encoder part of the transform architecture. You use, they are not well suited for next word prediction. So for classification, maybe that's true, but I don't know, I'm not really sure. But the, the, the model he uses is a mass mm -hmm. language model, it turns out, right? And all the, if you look in on Hugging Face library, there's like this section in Hugging Face where it's, you can ask for, hey, I want to do this task, class, text task classification. You click on that. They're almost always these uh, encoder-based BERT type models, which are mat trained on mask words. But I just thought there was a weird thing. You said like, what? Why would you say that? <laughs> yeah, uh, sounds like he misspoke there. Yeah. And then he, uh, also another thing, so for people who don't know Python, it's interesting at this point, he says, hey, if you don't know Python uh, very well, you might want to take a, a moment to go through and, and get familiarize yourself with these libraries if you're going to be doing a lot of this kind of thing. And Have you seen? Oh, sorry, I, I, I was asked if you've seen any impact with the NumPy 2.0. I have it now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. No. Uh, so these are the, the key libraries, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, for plotting or seaborn PyTorch um, is of course the particular deep learning framework that he's using here. But there's also TensorFlow, we should mention, right? Um, there's others like SKLearn, which is the I don't know what this cooling is in R, but it's uh, has all the machine learning uh, algorithms in it, and Stats Models, which has um, also has more traditional. Okay. More traditional, yeah, thank you. More traditional uh, regression and things like that uh, in it. Um, and so he recommends to do that, this book called Python for Data Analysis. And fortunately for us, there is uh, a book club also for this uh, Python for Data Analysis, which is pretty good here. So I recommend that if you don't, if you aren't familiar with these things yet or don't know what any of these even are, then I definitely recommend uh, considering that book club. But I actually won't, I don't think it'll slow you down in this book club very much because since everything's kind of at a higher level uh, learning this is more about learning what kind of things you can do like for example key takeaway here the, the thing is what's the key thing we learned we learned you can do this you can use nlp in an afternoon potentially to solve some problem that would have been completely impossible even a few years ago it's amazing right and even if you don't know python you could probably cut and paste someone else's code or use chat to help you do it and you can still get it done <laughs> right <laughs> because the yep. libraries are that high level almost all your problems are going to be at the getting the data in getting the data and then reading it in and then formatting it properly that's where all your problems are going to be <laughs> it's not going to be at the what seems like the hard part most likely right uh so that's pretty cool it's like he says in the video it's a huge opportunity here for 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 all of us right for nlp um he then talks a little bit about this misuse thing which is a little bit dated the kind of things he's talking about have gotten much worse. <laughs> right? I mean, he mentioned oh, yeah. these FCC comments to 2017 proposal, which are machine generated and may have had not affected the outcome. And this fake identity on LinkedIn with fake images and all that. But now we know this is, uh, wow, this has gotten much worse. There's someone on, there's videos you can, I mean, it's pretty frightening and something to be aware of the possibility of people fooling you with, with AI or fooling other people with AI or identity stealing and all kinds of the issues with AI. So one has to worry about that a lot. Um, I'd like to see an updated video from him on his opinion of this now, <laughs> the misuse of NLP and, and generative AI in general. I'm sure he had a lot, would have a lot more. So maybe he does on his blog, I didn't even look, but yeah. 
Oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is reiterating what I said. There was a final question where, yes, if you pass no leg, it was equal to one. Uh, I have to drop off. Thank you for this. Oh, yeah. Have a good we'll see you all next week. Yeah. Yeah. See you next week. Yeah. See you, John. Take care. Uh, the last, oh, I've mentioned this before with Hugging Face Tasks is a way to find out useful starting points for like whether you want to do text classifications, which we've been doing, uh, text generation, you know, chat GPT type things, question answering. Um, this is where you, you give it both a document and a question, and then you about that document, and then the, the model tries to give you an answer using that document. Um, and the only other thing I would mention just briefly is I did go through chapter 10. Did you go through chapter? Chapter 10, Aaron, did you read it? I did not. I read the, I, sorry, I watched the video, did not, uh, did not read the, the chapter this week. So this chat, the chapter 10 has, uh, is very similar content. I like some of the other cases, very similar content to yeah. the video, except again, it uses the fast AI library instead of the hugging face library, which means it uses RNNs instead of transformers and does this classification problem on the IMDB database, which is the same as he does in the paper, the U ULM paper. Uh, or it's not just him, I forget who the authors are, but the, the paper. Um, so, and he does mention in there that uh, in chapter 12 is going to go a lower level uh, on the NLP in the RNNs. This can be RNNs, of course, but in the part two of the course, uh, this course will go through, uh, will go deeper as well. And he does mention, that's in the video, he doesn't mention in the book, but I just point out that in part two of the course, we're going to go deeper into how some of these models work, right? I think he's going to spend a lot more time on convolution networks from looking ahead on the video titles, but I think at the end, do some transformer stuff. Because he does, I think the second part is focusing a lot on image generation, which is very fun, by the way, stable diffusion, all that kind of stuff. But yeah. But in the end, the transformers come in when you do this multi mode thing where you're like, oh, I want to, you know, generate an image from a text, right? So how do you do that? That's the, that's the cool uh, thing you can do so easily now, right? But. Uh <laughs> As, as a random aside, I don't know, you're just talking about generating faces. I have done that on my local laptop and uh, my laptop gets so freaking hot <laughs> uh, running those things. You know, I have a, a cooling pad, but it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, so I always kind of worry. And I should probably just uh, cloud it, man. move to the cloud if, I'm, yeah. if I do that. <laughs> Burn somebody else's machine up. <laughs> That's what I say. Well, yeah, I exactly. Either. I mean, I did the same thing my my desktop too. Like it shut down on me one time tra training a language model, but yeah, it was a graph neural network problem I was training, and it you know it took like it was training for like an hour and then it just like shut off. <laughs> the fan was going like getting busted. Yeah. I'm done. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can completely toast your your PC if you're not about. careful. Yeah. Oh, one other thing I wanted to just did you guys? Well, he didn't read the chapter. Doesn't really matter, but I did notice in the chapter he talks about embedding vectors um so what happens these numerical right so the, the number for each subword token is actually a category right it's a you know what category it's a categorization problem right um and when it goes to the end mm -hmm. outputs a number 77 is the next word right or actually it outputs a, a set of probabilities for what the next word is right um so it's a classification problem on what the next word is or the, or the mask word is it where right um so the re how that's handled in interior to the model is through this idea of embedding vectors. So it embeds these numbers into a higher dimensional space and some n dimensional space. And he talks a little bit about this in the chapter. I just wanted to point out that he doesn't talk about it in the video at all. Um, and I don't know if he will ever talk about it, but it's um, only talked about briefly because it's really covered in chapter nine of the book on tabular data. So I just want to point out if, you, if that's something that's interesting to you, you have to go back to chapter nine to learn about these embedding. Uh, layers maybe it'll come up later in the in the course i don't know but yeah and those n-dimensional embeddings i mean that's a simplification right of the initial uh uh numbers right or do i have that backwards I th it's, it's actually backwards so you do you take every number and now you're going to embed in this n-dimensional space so now every word now lives in this you know you know let's say 128 dimensional space and words that are close together presumably have similar meaning, right, in the embedding space. So it learns this embedding. It learns the embedding uh, do, while it's doing the next language, uh, next, sorry, next word prediction, right? And so the, it, and the, and the whole point of the transformer is to take this embedding and transform it layer by layer and layer to add more and more meaning to what's in the embedding based yeah. on other words. So the very first layer is just about the word, right? I don't know if you heard of this, like, king. Was it king plus woman equals queen or something like that. There's this famous thing where you take the embedding vector of king 
and the embedding vector for woman and, and add them together, literally mathematically add them together, you get something close to the embedding vector for, for queen. That's the kind of things that it learns and the very first layer and the embedding layer. Yeah, yeah. And so the embedding layer already has meaning, but it doesn't have any meaning about other words. It doesn't know anything about any other words in your sentence. And then it, the transformer now connects, or the RNN connects the, in each layer, learns more and more and more about the, the word in context. Until at the end, you have one final vector, which is going to predict what that most likely next word would have been, or masked word, as the case may be. It's pretty cool. Yep, yep, but, yep. Yeah. But these embedding layers can All be right. used for, uh, in other cases, too. Like uh, in chapter nine, he talks about using them when you have when you have a categorical variable let's say i don't know could i just have four categories or whatever right you can embed that into a you know 20 dimensional vector space um uh, and then you can learn much better uh and in, in, in the in, um they can learn a meaningful embedding for the categories that it can then use to make your predictions whatever your problem happens to be you know? kind of a cool little aside there but i just want to point that because anyone was reading the chapter and they're like hey what the heck are you talking about that's chapter nine <laughs> Maybe it comes up later in this thing. I don't know. Yeah. And I know like embeddings are sometimes used in kind of traditional machine learning models too, right? You can, um, yeah. I haven't really played around with that myself, but but yeah, I mean, you can kind of feed these in embedded vectors into like an XGBoost model from what I understand. Right. Exactly right. We did that with some neural networks, some, sorry, with some uh, graph uh, networks I was working with where I would use the graph machine, uh, the graph neural network to train an embedding for the node. So the node embeddings now not only contain information what yeah. the node has, but it has information about this neighborhood, what kind of structure it's in. Then I just take those embeddings and fit them into XG boost to uh, make my final classification prediction. It works surprisingly well. Pretty well, yeah. that's good. Yeah, because then I can add other things. Like I have now I have the network kind of represented as an embedding vector that only contains the geometry essentially. And I can add all the other features of the nodes, like, oh, you know, this is a bank or this is a, you know, whatever else it happens to be. So, yeah. Kind of a merged approach there. Anyway, that's, let me stop sharing here because I sure. can put my screen up and down like a silly person. There we go. And any any other comments before I hit stop? No, I don't think so. This was a, this was a good one for sure. Good, uh, good lesson. And yeah, fairly modern, forward. right? Yeah. Um, I look forward to the next one where you get, step down to the we're already next last thing i start talking about the lower level um like how these things work so <laughs> not transformers but these machine learning the models in, in general right all right i'll hit the stop button